Hey y'all, thanks for all the questions. I'm actually on my way out to go chase some penguins right now, so I'm in a bit of a hurry. I'll answer some questions right now, and probably some when I get back. Maybe if we camp out for a while, we get some, get some videos filmed while I'm still out there chasing penguins. So first one we have is Josiah asked, do sea urchins have poison? Some do, so don't just pick up any sea urchin you find and eat it. Uh, some also have venom, so the difference between venom and poison, but some of you might already know, venom is injected into you, so like the sea urchins have those pokey barbs, some of them have venom, and then some have poison, where if you eat them, you get sick. Yeah, so don't just pick up any random sea urchin you find. Uh, Kina are long known to be delicious and safe to eat. Uh, they do have those little pokey barbs, so you wear gloves when doing it. Colleen asked, what do the sea urchins taste like? Um, they taste like mussels and clams, kind of, but generally you have those cooked. So they were raw, which made them a bit saltier than being, you know, in the ocean. Um, yeah, they're kind of really salty and kind of like a clam or a mussel, I think is the closest I can picture for it. Uh, it's very little meat on them, so you get like a ton of them to make one meal, and you just scrape out that little bit, and it's, um, yeah, maybe, maybe sushi, maybe some sushi kind of tastes like it, the more like fishy, salty ones. What do you use to edit? I use VideoPad Editor because it is free. Bella asked, how big do kiwis usually get? So there's a bunch of different species of kiwi. Uh, so the smallest one is maybe like that tall-ish. Um, and then the biggest one will be about this. Uh, they're not huge, but mostly it's that beak. That beak is like, phew, pretty impressive, yeah. Um, so yeah, not too huge, but they're really cowardly. Oh, it just started raining again. Uh, we had an Antarctic current come up last night, so it's really, really cold, thus jackets and all that, and it brought some rain with it. Um, yeah, so kiwi are really cowardly, and they're at night all the time. Uh, they, they're they nocturnal, so it's really hard to spot them, especially when they're small, um, and most of them are. The North Island brown kiwi, the one in this area, they're about that big, yeah. Carson asked, is there merch? Yes, exactly the same merch as the last time you asked. Carson also asked, is the reason why the plants aren't usually deadly because they sometimes blow up into blue goo? I feel like this is a reference I'm missing. The Nikki asked, what is the average size of the penguins that you catch? Um, my species of penguin is about a kilogram. The girls are a bit smaller right at a kilogram, and then the boys are a little bit heavier at 1.1 kilograms. Uh, so that's like about two pounds for each of them. They're really tiny, yeah. And then for height, they're like 30 to 40 centimeters generally. So also pretty small, that's a bit more than a foot. Sarah Pate asks, Hi, where are the penguins at? I want to see penguins. So I can't tell you exactly where they are, but I know they're all up and down the coast of New Zealand. We have to keep the exact locations of the burrows kind of secret because they'll sometimes abandon their nests, abandon their chicks and their eggs if they're bothered too often. So I can't give specific locations. I can tell you, Tafur Nui, Pokehinu Island, Teri Teri Mitongi Island, which that one's pretty touristy, so um, people are aware where they are there. Uh, and then Otata Island. Um, and then all along the coast of New Zealand, there's plenty of penguins, yeah. Jaslyn asks, what exactly is the native language? So it's Te Reo Māori. Uh, so Māori, Māori actually just means a normal person, because for hundreds of years, Māori were the only people here, so they had no one to compare themselves to. So Māori means normal person, but it's now referred to the Māori culture, the uh, indigenous New Zealand culture. And then Te Reo means the language. Uh, so again, because there was one language, I mean, there are, there are dialects of it, kind of like how English, we have New Zealand English, uh, UK English, American English, and they're a bit different. It's kind of like that as well. Māori had different uh, dialects, has different dialects, um, but for the most part, it was the one language, it was Māori. So they just said, the language, Te Reo. And then, uh, because Te Reo also means the language for Samoan and Fijian and Tongan and all that, so then you would say, Te Reo Māori. So, the language of Māori, or Te Reo Samoa, or I think it's Manu, actually. Te Reo Manu for uh, Samoan. Yes, the owl picked up. This is my favorite from Jasmine. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Trevor asks, is it fun having the job that you have right now? Yeah, it's super fun. I get to go out and chase penguins and always Corora everywhere. Oh, it's super cool getting to see all these amazing places. Yeah, I'm loving it. Is it fun traveling to all those different places? Yeah, I love it. Travel's one of my favorite things. Even when I was in the US, uh, if you remember last spring break, for those of you that I was working with last year, uh, I was gone the week after spring break. That was because I was doing a road trip around the US, went to a bunch of different states. I love to travel. I went to every county in Ireland. I did a ring around Iceland when I was there, tried to get to as much of South Africa as I could, and now I'm working on getting to as much of New Zealand as I can. I love it. It's fantastic. Bear asked, why are there no bears there? Well, it's because you haven't come to visit yet. Come on. Ethan asked, is it hard to sleep at night in the wilderness? Uh, sometimes, if it gets pretty chilly or rainy or something, like the first night I was out at Waipua, um, it got pretty rainy, it got pretty cold, and because I didn't start putting up my tent until it was already dark, I didn't put up my tent the best way, so that didn't keep me as warm as it probably should have. Um, but yeah, I have a really warm uh, sleeping bag. It's a U.S. military surplus one, so it'll keep me warm in, like, Antarctica. Um, but the water was a bit annoying that did get into the tent a little bit. Um, as far as, like, animals, it's not super loud. Sometimes the birds are calling and those things, but I, I like that. Maybe to some people it bother them, but I quite like it. Avery asked, did that sea urchin actually taste good? I don't think so. 
Uh, yeah, I actually really did like it. Uh, it was a very interesting taste. It's a it's a very new taste to me, but I quite liked it. Alexis K asked, what's your favorite thing to do in the forest? Oh, go look for things. You just keep as quiet as you can so you don't bother the animals, and then you walk along and try to spot anything you can. So you saw a lot of kaka, kakariki, and that doesn't mean poop. Kaka is a parrot, uh, and kakariki is a parakeet. Saw loads of those, and we saw a bellbird, um, tui, uh, pakeko takahe, uh, loads of native birds, and they're, they're super cool to get to see, but you have to be really quiet. Okay, one thing to remember on that though, if you're somewhere with dangerous animals, be loud when you're walking. You're going to see fewer animals, but you don't want to surprise a dangerous animal. So like if you're like in Alaska or Montana or something like that, you don't want to surprise a bear. So you want to be talking, you want to be making noise. But here in New Zealand where it's safe, go ahead and sneak up on the animals. And is New Zealand hot? Well, I haven't been here for the summer yet, and people are telling me it gets pretty hot, but I think that's hot for their standards. It's like if a Canadian is telling you it's hot. It's probably not actually hot, at least not to a Texan. Ashley Stotts asks, are there any ticks in New Zealand? There are, not as many as you would have in some places, like particularly a lot of deer hunters have that problem of ticks getting into, into their clothing in Texas. There are ticks here, but not as many. Um, and that's actually related to my penguins. Uh, sometimes my penguins get infected with ticks, particularly the chicks, or whenever the penguins, the corora, are coming ashore to molt, they'll get infected with ticks. It's not usually a source of mortality, but I imagine it's pretty stressful for them. While they're on land, the corora are infected with those, but then once they go back into the water, the ticks just drop off, because the ticks can't survive in water. So it's mostly whenever they're on land for those extended periods of time, like molting or looking after their chicks. McKinley asks, do the sea urchins taste weird? Yes. Good, but weird. Olivia asks, what's your favorite out of the three birds you checked out? Mine is the kiwi. And that question's from Olivia. It's really tough to say. Uh, I really love the corora. I really love the penguins. Um, the oe, I've worked with them a fair bit, but they're not super cool. Uh, I actually don't work with the kiwi. The kiwi are, um, I still haven't seen one. I mean, I've seen a few at the zoo, but uh, that doesn't super count. Yeah, I don't work with them, and I'm very much looking forward to finally seeing one in the wild. But yeah, it's definitely got to be the Corora out of the three I work with. If you're stranded in the middle of the jungle, what three items would you bring? Compass, so I'm not stranded anymore. Uh, some way to make fire. Um, you can sometimes find it, but particularly if you're in a wet forest, you really want like a fire starter of some sort. And something to make cover with, like a, a tarp or a sleeping bag or a tent would be awesome. Yeah, so you need shelter, warmth, and getting out of there. I can provide my own food. Um, there's loads of water here, at, at least I'm assuming in this. We're in New Zealand, we're in Aotearoa. Uh, I'm able to find my own food, and there's plenty of water, so it's more about getting out, staying warm, and staying sheltered. Devin asked, how big around are the trees? I didn't measure them because I can't touch them, but they're enormous. Uh, probably four or five people could wrap their arms all the way around a full-grown cardi. Braden Drake asked, where are you from and where do you live? Uh, I'm from Texas, and I live here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I live in South Auckland here. Sammy asked, is it dark up there when you post it? So I am 17 hours ahead of you guys. So what that means is I'm a day ahead and then seven hours behind. So when you're at noon, I'm at 5 a.m. When you're at 7 p.m., I'm at noon, um, but a day ahead. Um, so, I mean, I post them at kind of different times. Uh, I'm not too sure on that, but yeah, we're like seven hours separate. And Sammy also asked, can you send a fern up here? You have ferns there. If you look around there, you got little broad-leafed ones, and it looks like there's like 300 leaves on one little bigger branch type of thing. Yeah, there's ferns there. Sammy also asked, what do you eat up there when you sleep in the forest? So while I was up there on that one, I just brought a bunch of oatmeal and hard-boiled eggs and vegetables and some chicken and those sorts of things. Uh, if I really had to go full survival mode, I would probably head to the water and get uh, sea urchins or fish or something like that. But we plan ahead so we don't get into that. Uh, my favorite thing to bring on field trips is biltong, which is this South African beef jerky-like thing. It lasts forever and it's absolutely delicious. And there's a really good butcher right around the corner from me that I can get it from because I haven't been able to find it since South Africa. Trenton asks, what's your favorite tree? A baobab tree. Uh, they're the very distinct tree you think of when you think Lion King, when you think Africa. They're so cool. They're just giant around and have very few leaves. They're really ad perfectly adapted to their environment. And when you see a baobab tree, it just very distinctly tells you where you are in the world and what type of habitat you're in. Mark asks, how did you find the beach? Uh, there was a sign on the road that just said, turn here to go to Momofongata. And I followed the beach, or that road to the beach. Um, I actually got lost. I was going to camp along one other side of it. And someone came up to me and said, hey, you shouldn't be camping here. They're going to get mad at you. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and was leaving. And they're like, no, no, you just go to the other side. You go to the other side. And the other side ended up being more amazing. I wasn't aware it was there. But it was the other side of the peninsula uh, into a more protected bay rather than facing out into the open gulf. So it was less windy. There were more animals and some really great views there. Brooklyn Davis asked, is it fun to explore and learn about all the trees? Do you enjoy the adventures you go on? Absolutely love it. It's fantastic. And it's why I chose this line of work, to be able to do these sorts of things. Go out and explore the world, see all these amazing natural habitats. It's, it's really cool, um, and particularly the trees, because like Texas, or at least our part of Texas, 
Uh, forests aren't really that big a thing. Ireland, forests weren't really that big a thing. Uh, South Africa, I mean, there was forest, but it was more like bush forest. It was kind of like that sort of habitat you have between Corpus and San Antonio, like low trees, scrubby type thing. So it's really cool going into those really tall, ancient forests. Uh, they're very different. It's, um, it's a really cool, different experience to what I'm used to. And Carly also asked, how big are kiwi eggs? Enormous. It's unbelievable how big their eggs are. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get this a bit wrong, but it's about that big around. And the kiwi is not that much bigger. So because of that, they can only lay one egg at a time. Uh, imagine the mother trying to carry around two or three of those. That would be impossible. They would like double in size carrying those eggs. So they just lay one egg, and it's really, uh, really stressful on the body for that. So whereas most birds will continue to forage and trade off in between, uh, generally the kiwi mother will spend more time on the egg, and um, the male will go off and do more of the foraging and come back, and then they'll start trading off once the mother's done a bit of recovery, more similar to a mammal rather than other birds where most birds pretty interchangeably swap off. Yeah, thanks for all the questions. I'm going to go chase some penguins right now. I'm actually probably running a bit late having answered these questions and hopefully get some really cool videos. I know in my last trip, I've actually done three penguin trips this week, so I've got tons of really cool footage, footage for you guys, and hopefully we'll be seeing that soon. See y'all later. Hey, yo, got back from the trip late last night, so I'll finish up the questions right now. So bear, actual answer, because I know you were kind of kidding right there, but the actual answer why there's no bears in New Zealand in Aotearoa is because Aotearoa split off from the rest of the world millions and millions and millions of years ago, long before mammals were widespread. So no mammals here. Thus, the only native mammals to Aotearoa before humans arrived and brought with them dogs and sheep and goats and deer and all that stuff was a couple species of bats. Yeah, so they could fly over from Australia, and that's how they got here, but no land mammals really could arrive. And bears definitely don't want to swim that far, except polar bears, which definitely do, but thankfully they're they're far, far north where I don't have to worry about them. And Kinley asked how Aotearoa is different from the U.S. So they're pretty similar as any country is. People are people anywhere, um, particularly, you know, English is the primary language here. Te reo is usually spoken mostly in words and phrases as opposed to whole conversations, at least here in Tamaki Makaro. Uh, I do know it's different in some other areas. Te reo is much more used as the lingua franca, or as the main language. But not so much here in Tamaki Makaro. It's mostly just for individual words or phrases or something like that. So for the most part, it's pretty similar, but it's different in a few key ways. Uh, it's a very multicultural place. I'm getting the impression that most Kiwi have lived overseas at some point, or at least have traveled extensively, as well as, at least in Tamaki Makaro, uh, about 30% of the population is from another country. So it's very multicultural, you have a bunch of different foods and languages and everything mixing together, um, as well as that means that they're going to be very open to people from other places and very quickly just get used to it. It's not an oddity of someone being from somewhere else, it's just, oh, it's another person that happened to be from somewhere else, which is really nice as someone coming from somewhere else. And then in general, Kiwi are very quiet, polite, humble people. Uh, I've heard a lot of times in specific reference to like celebrities from here. There aren't a ton of celebrities from Aotearoa, but like the band Fly to the Concords, they very famously gave up having this very successful TV show on HBO just because they didn't want to get too famous. And uh, they say that if anyone sees them on the street and gets excited, they probably know it's not a Kiwi because Kiwi are pretty much just like, oh yeah, good, good on you, good on you, your band's doing well. Instead of getting excited and uh, loud and everything. And the same thing for the All Blacks and Silver Ferns rugby teams. They're the best in the world but they just walk down the street like anyone else. Uh, they're very humble people. And then I also saw it at the Silver Ferns and All Blacks matches for the uh, women's and men's rugby teams. Uh, I went to their matches a few weeks ago against Australia, where they won big time, and I got to see the Prime Minister and her newborn baby there, which is super cool. Uh, and they won the tournament, which is essentially the World Championship because they were playing against the other best teams in the world. And whenever there would be something exciting going on in the game, usually like in the US, when you're at a sports match, it's very loud, it's very exciting. If the ref says something you don't like, kind of shout at them, aren't so super polite. But Kiwis were pretty, um, they were pretty polite about it. It was dead silent most of the game. Something exciting would happen, they'd stand up and clap and cheer for a couple minutes and then sit back down very politely. And then the referee would do something they'd agree, disagree with. And that happened quite a few times in, in that match. There were some very questionable calls. And they would just more or less be like, I'm not sure about that one. I, I'm not sure I agree with that and then go back to being quiet after just a couple minutes. So very quiet, humble, polite people. Drake asks, what are the biggest animals you've handled? So this is a bit of a misconception and one I really wish could be differently, um, but it's for safety. You can't really handle big, dangerous animals. Um, can't walk up to a tiger and just like, you know, handle it, carry it, move it or anything. It's a danger. Uh, so even in zoos, usually the animal will have to be tranquilized if you're doing any actual handling of it. Or for like calmer big species, like an elephant, uh, they can be trained to be very uh, well-behaved. 
So like if you have to file down their nails or whatever, they'll just lift up their foot very calmly. But that's for the calm animals. You don't want to do that with a lion or a tiger or something like that. Uh, even the great apes, because they're so strong, even if they're trying to be gentle, they can cause a lot of harm. So usually um, they're put to sleep before you handle them. But that being said, there are some things you can handle with some very big precautions to them. And the biggest that I've worked with were probably the Burmese python and a uh, American alligator up in San Antonio, as well as alligator snapping turtles. They're not as big, but they are super, super dense and very, very bitey, thus the name. Um, worked with tons of green sea turtles. They aren't huge, but they're pretty, pretty heavy. They're very dense. Um, and then a bald eagle. They're not giant, but they're very powerful. And that was kind of, uh, kind of intimidating, the size of their claws. And then every single time that she was flapping her wings, it just felt like a tornado was coming at me. Just super strong animal. Yeah, so those are probably the biggest I've handled, like the Burmese python and the American alligator. We need a few people holding, because Burmese python can be, you know, 20, 25 feet and a few hundred pounds, and if they want to move, they're going to move. Same thing with the American alligator. You have to take a lot of precautions. Um, and then not handled, but interacted with in some of those limited settings, like having a fence between you, or um, they're asleep, something like that. That's been with elephant, rhino, and awake gray wolves. So those are pretty cool. And Carly asks, how cold is it there? So here in Aotearoa, um, it doesn't get super cold. Um, the furthest south it gets is getting fairly close to Antarctica. But the thing you have to remember, and you see it even in Texas, is anytime you're near a coast, it's going to be a more moderate temperature. You can't get too hot, you can't get too cold. And you see that there in Corpus. Corpus doesn't get as hot as San Antonio or as cold uh, whenever you're in the winter and summer. It's a much more moderated temperature. Um, Iceland, I think, is a fantastic example. Parts of Iceland are in the Arctic Circle, really, really far north, but you're able to walk around it in short sleeves, uh, at least when the sun's out, because it's complete pitch blackness in the winter, so obviously you can't do it then. But in the summer, you can walk around in sleeves because you're along the coast. It keeps you relatively moderate temperature. And that's the reason, like, Anchorage, Alaska has better weather than Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, because Minneapolis is far away from water. It doesn't have as regulated a temperature as does Anchorage being on the coast. Um, so that one can sometimes be surprising. You can go to surprisingly high latitudes and still not be super cold. So, get back to the original thing. Uh, here in Tamaki Makro, it doesn't get super hot or super cold because we're on the coast. Uh, we're about as far south as Colorado is far north. So it can get a bit chilly, but but not really that much. Like right now is the, probably about the coldest since I've been here. And it's 10 degrees Celsius, which is not that cold. And, and this is just coming out of winter. Yeah, so not too bad. But as you head further down south to Queenstown and Dunedin, I have heard it gets pretty cold. It approaches freezing most of the time in the winter. And then once you get up into the mountains, like particularly Queenstown or some of those really high southern Alps there, they get really cold. Uh, Alraki, the tallest mountain in New Zealand, is regularly down to negative 30, which is it's pretty chilly. But that's, you know, you're climbing a mountain. You expect it to get pretty cold. But anywhere along the coasts, it's not too bad. And most people live near Tamaki Makaro or the... Uh, the surrounding area where it's relatively warm.